79. Um, okay, so I should probably start by saying, well, I'll start by saying I'm, it's a pleasure to be here and in contact at least with um, Tromsø. Uh, this is not a research talk, really. Um, I'm in the process of putting some material together for a book, and there are certain topics that I cover in the book, and to some extent, this is some of that book material, to s and I'm interested in feedback from people, ideally positive feedback, but negative feedback if that's what it has to be, about vaguely what level this is pitched at, whether it's appropriate, whether you learned something from it, whether you knew it all already, and so forth. So in a, in a rather inelegant introduction in Aarhus um, several weeks ago, Frank Jensen told the audience they were guinea pigs. And so you're a new set of guinea pigs for this. So the outline here, and I'm going to try and remember to use this uh, at times, uh, because obviously you can't see a laser pointer. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about rotations in three-dimensional space. Uh, I'm going to talk about both spin and orbital angular momentum. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about the symmetry of that and how we represent it. Um, I'll talk a little bit then about more um, formal group theoretical properties of these various uh, operations. Then I'll talk about ways of treating them uh, this is very superficial at this point, using both double groups and the method of so-called ray representations. And I'm going to close, if I can use the board, with a thing we call Dirac's construction, which, if you haven't met it, you might find interesting. So uh, there are obviously very deep connections between the various angular momenta we encounter, uh, at least for ourselves, in quantum mechanics, also in other contexts, of course. Uh, and what probably concerns us most, whether we're interested in relativistic or non-relativistic pictures, is the, um, the spin of the, the intrinsic spin of the electron and its angular momentum. They have different symmetry properties, but as we'll see, they're related. And there are different methods of connecting these different symmetries. Uh, I've already mentioned um, double groups and ray representations. And I'm going to start by considering rotations in three-dimensional space. So this is normally done by um, so-called Euler angles. Rotations in three space are orthogonal matrices with determinant plus one. If you allow determinant minus one as well, you have rotations, reflections, and in the, the inversion. But we're going to focus purely on rotations. Uh, if you think about a three by three matrix, it has nine elements but I've said I want my transformations to be orthogonal and they have to be unimodular. They have to have determinant plus one. That means the columns, say, of the matrix have to be orthogonal to one another. That's three constraints. And they have to be normalized to unity, which is three more constraints. So out of those nine parameters um, in a three by three matrix, in this case, we have three free parameters. So the group is denoted SO3. S for special, because the determinant's plus one, O for orthogonal, and three for three space, or in this case, three parameters. The usual way of dealing with this is by Euler angles. Now, I find all the diagrams of Euler angles in all the textbooks extremely complicated, which is why I haven't reproduced them here, because I shall look like an idiot waving at the screen and pointing out um, which axis you're rotating about now. But the three free parameters in the Euler angle model are denoted conventionally phi, theta, and chi, or sometimes alpha, beta, and gamma. And what you do is you rotate through an angle theta about the original z-axis, which, of course, changes the x and y axes in general. And then you rotate through theta about the new y-axis. And then that changes, of course, the x and z-axis, the new x and the old z and then you rotate through chi about the new z-axis. And that lets you parameterize any rotation in three dimensions. You can do it in reverse order. I, uh, this is another thing I always find surprising, but you can show this. You can apply the rotations in reverse order um, using just the original axes, which in some ways is more convenient. But it doesn't matter really which way you tackle this, the key thing that I want to focus on first is that here everything 
is rotated. Not just the object that you want to rotate, but you also rotate the coordinate system along with the object. So the object is tied to the coordinate system. And Euler posed a question, mathematicians are good at this, especially very famous ones, posing questions and not asking them, and not answering them, uh, and then getting their name on things because they asked the question even though they didn't answer it. And Euler posed this question. He said, what is the equivalent to this? How do we parameterize a rotation around some arbitrary axis but we keep the coordinate system fixed, so we just rotate the object, which is a little bit more commonsensical, what you might think of when you, um, when you rotate something. And Euler, as I say, didn't answer this, it was answered by actually a very remarkable man named Rodrigue, or Rodriguez if you want to Spanishize it, but Rodrigue was actually French. There are some the name looks Portuguese, and there are some books that will tell you he was Portuguese. That's not so. He was French. But he was unfortunate enough to be born French-Jewish in the early part of the 19th century, which is a time of extreme anti-Semitism in France. And Jews were labeled as Portuguese. That's what the label meant, rather than Jews. And because of the, uh, the views um, generally about Jews, Rodrigue, who would have liked to study maths to the level of becoming a professor, or at the very least something like a high school teacher, um, was unable to be trained for any of those jobs because the, they simply weren't allowed into the universities. And he trained as a banker and was a very successful one and later on became a sort of philanthropist and Fabian socialist. Very, very interesting man and I encourage you to read up about him, Oland Rodrigue. It's a nice biography by Simon Altman. But Rodrigue's answer was actually very simple. Take the arbitrary axis and look down it so that the axis, just as a sign convention, the axis is pointing at you that you want to rotate around. And then if n is a vector that points along that axis towards you, rotation through phi about that axis is parameterized in this way. You have a cosine term, and then you have three sine terms that involve the x, y, and z components of that vector that points along the axis. That's very nice. It's a very simple formula, but if you look at it for a while and think about it for a while, you might pose the question, what happens if we rotate through 2 pi? Yes. Yes? Yeah? The last three is a vector. These are the components, x, y, and z components oh, of a vector along... Yeah, yeah, these are the... Com sorry, I thought I said this is the x, the y, and the z component of that vector. You could write this as sine phi over 2 times the vector in some sense. We'll see a better way for doing that in a moment. But the question that ought to keep you awake at night when you first think about it is what happens when phi is 2 pi? We know what rotation through 2 pi is. It's the identity. It takes you back to where you started, 360 degrees. But if you plug it into this formula, phi equals 2 pi, the only surviving term is the cosine term, and cosine of pi is minus 1. So rotation through 2 pi in this Rodrigue model is not the identity. If you want the identity, you would have to rotate through, say, 4 pi, or a multiple of 4 pi. This is really key to most of what we're going to be looking at through, although that may not always be immediately obvious, through the rest of the lecture. Now, rotation through 4 pi being the identity and 2 pi changing the sign, this is something that comes up often enough in spectroscopy and relativistic quantum mechanics and things like that, that people often get the impression that this has something to do with quantum mechanics or relativity. It doesn't at all. Rodrigue came up with this in the 1830s. Nobody knew about electrons in the 1830s, much less relativity. So it's, it's really uh, a, a mathematical thing that has uh, no immediate derivation from quantum mechanics or relativity. It's really 
and we'll come back to this at the end of the lecture, it's a consequence of fixing the reference frame. Remember I said what we want to do, what Euler said what he wanted to know the answer to was if we fix the reference frame, the coordinate system, and just rotate the object, how do we parameterize it? And the answer is, um, we, if we parameterize this way, we arrive at this situation where we need to rotate through 4 pi. That formula, and this was my remark to you a moment ago, Trigva, that formula of Rodrigues actually defines a quaternion. For those of you who don't know quaternions, this is um, uh, an extension uh, like the reals to the complex. A complex number is really just a two vector of real numbers. The quaternion is four. Rodrigue came up with this a decade before Hamilton. Hamilton's quite rightly uh, credited with um, coming up with this and publishing it, because he certainly did it independently. But in fact, quaternions are central to that description of Rodrigues. So let me switch now, having talked a bit about rotations, and talk a bit about things rotating, namely angular momentum. So if we have a set of operators that obey this commutation relation and this um, uh, three index quantity, this tensor here is the anti-symmetric tensor on three objects. So it's plus one for even permutations, minus one for odd, and zero if any indices coincide. So it's clear that the three components uh, of angular momentum don't commute. And that means, as we learn in elementary quantum mechanics, we can find simultaneous eigenfunctions of, say, j squared, which commutes with all of them, and one other element, which is conventionally taken as the z component. And, of course, we associate quantum numbers with those j and mj. Uh, in addition, uh, rather than, since we've taken jz here, rather than take jx and jy, it's more convenient to define j plus and j minus, which are the familiar shift operators that let you shift the mj value up and down, or give zero. So all well known and all taught in the best kindergartens these days. Let's zoom in for a moment on orbital angular momentum. Well, you ought to, you ought to go to the right kindergartens, I guess. <laughs> yes. um, so j equals l, the orbital angular momentum. And the eigenfunctions, this is very well known, again, from elementary, for example, quantum mechanics, although it's not unique to it. The eigenfunctions are the so-called spherical harmonics, characterized by the quantum numbers L and the projection ML. Theta and phi are angles, azimuthal and equatorial angles. Um, and these things are denoted Y. And for those of you who want to be reminded of this, but it's not really necessary for what we're going to discuss here. We have a normalization constant, which ought to carry indices. And then we have an associated Legendre function. P depends on L and the absolute value of ML. And then an angular term in phi. And if you want real spherical harmonics, you can take linear combinations of those. Let's rotate this through some arbitrary angle defined by an operator R. I'm not worrying about how I'm parameterizing it at this point. We just rotate a spherical harmonic. Well, it ought to be clear that you can't change the L value just by rotating it. You can't rotate an S function into a D function. You can't rotate a P function into an F function. So rotation can mix the ML values but it can't change the L values. And that's encapsulated in this formula. We have a summation over the ML values, the other possible ML values, and we have a coefficient specific to a, a given rotation, which depends on L, which is fixed, ML prime, and ML, which is fixed. I've already said the L values don't mix. And so we could, if we chose, relabel these coefficients in the following way. We could have matrices, which is specific to each L value, D of L, and they carry the ML, the projection indices, and they depend on R. And this, of course, now looks an awful lot, if you stop and think about it, like a representation matrix for a group, like a point group, and indeed it is, 
and I'll come back to that in a moment, but since it is essentially a, a group representation, it will provide us with representation matrices and also by various techniques, basis functions for the different representations of SO3, the rotation group in three dimensions. Yes? Ah, right. Okay. Uh, yes, I, I am tempted to go. Yes, of course, I guess they're seeing that not, and not me pointing on the screen, aren't they? Yes, it's very disorienting, this. Sorry about this. So we're going to, I'm now going to set about parameterizing these representation matrices. So I'm going to get explicit about the R in that previous formula at the bottom there. Uh, and I'll do it in terms of Euler angles here. So we have theta uh, phi, theta, and chi again, and we, it can be shown with a certain degree of um, algebra that these matrices have elements that look like this. There are two uh, complex exponential factors in phi and chi, and then sandwiched between them by convention, we have uh, a, an object labeled with a small d, I'm not going to go into the details of this, but it's a polynomial in trigonometric factors, cosines and sines, and those trigonometric factors again involve half angles, theta over 2. Um, so we got the half angles back, but we actually don't get any problems with SO3, with orbital angular momentum, because that, that's associated with integer L, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, that's a 100 krona fine. Um, and you're welcome to keep it on, because if it goes off again, it's a 1,000 krona fine. And you can do the maths. Um, to charity, not to me, by the way. Um, so, for integer L, for integer L, these matrices are well behaved. The half angles don't give us any problem. The identity is the rotation through 2 pi. And we know these representations. They have dimension 2L plus 1, and we call them S, P, D, and F, and so forth. Let's turn now from orbital angular momentum to spin angular momentum. In some ways, this is a bit simpler. And in some ways, as we'll see, it's a lot more complicated. Simplest case, one electron, we have S equals a half. And there are two possible projections of S equals a half. That's plus a half and minus a half, which are often denoted alpha for spin up and beta for spin down. And then we can use these uh, formulas uh, and the behavior under operations like SZ and S squared and so forth to come up with formulas uh, like, for example, the spin projection, of course, has value a half here for the alpha alpha matrix element. S squared has a value 3 quarters, SS plus 1. And um, if we apply the shift operator to the beta function, then we get the alpha function. And so we can uh, define all these sorts of matrix elements. There are a lot of ways to handle this. I think the simplest, being a sort of matrix vector-oriented sort of person, is via two elementary spin functions denoted by two, the, the following two vectors, that's spin up and spin down. And then you can write operations by matrices that multiply into this so-called spinner basis. For example, S plus is given by this matrix, multiplying these vectors. Gives zero when you multiply it on this, because you can't increase the spin further, spin projection. And it gives you this vector when you multiply this into this. So that's matrix form of our shift operator. That matrix, of course, is singular, which is not very convenient because all the stuff we know about algebras and groups and things tends to be defined only for cases where there is an inverse, which means the matrices need to be non-singular. And the commonest way to do that, again taught in the best kindergartens, is via a set of matrices that were first introduced by, or at least credited, to Wolfgang Pauli. You need four matrices, and you can use them to generate any unitary transformation with positive or negative 
determinant, although we're going to focus in on two-dimensional unitary transformations with plus one determinant, special SU2. These four matrices, uh, each of those is unitary. Well, we need that as a basis or as a, a parameterization of the unitary group. And they are... Uh, they satisfy this normalization condition that uh, they multiply by themselves to give into themselves to give uh, a unit matrix. And using these four elementary Pauli matrices, we can write any unitary rotation in two dimensions. So that's SU2, as I said, as a matrix U, which is a linear combination of the four Pauli matrices. We only need real values of alpha. You don't need complex values of alpha to satisfy this. And we have this normalization condition that the squares of the alphas add up to 1. Um, and this gives, for example, if we want to rewrite our operators in terms of um, these Pauli matrices, that, for example, S squared is 3 quarters of Sigma zero, which I'll remind you, is the identity matrix, the unit matrix. Uh, S plus is then a half sigma one plus I sigma two and so forth. And you write everything down in this way. Now we can connect this to rotations in three space. And we can do it in a very simple way that carries both Euler and Rodrigue's name, although, again, the only reason it's got Euler's name is because he asked the question, not because he answered it. So it's not really very fair. But in the literature, this is referred to as the Euler-Rodrigue parameterization. And if you construct a matrix, which I've given you the explicit, three by three matrix, which I've given you the explicit form for here, in terms of the coefficients, alpha, for some unitary, two-dimensional unitary rotation. In this way, this matrix O, you can write this out, and on a wet afternoon, if you want something to do, you can multiply it by itself, or by its transpose, better said, and you will find that O times its transpose gives you the identity matrix. So O is an element of SO3. It's got determinant plus one, and it, um, it is an orthogonal matrix. But what's the connection between SU2 and SO3? And here's where it starts to get interesting, because we can take the very simple case, um, it's a perfectly well-defined choice, that all of the alphas are 0, except for alpha 0, which we take to be plus 1. And... The alternative is to take the situation where alpha 0 is minus 1 and all the other alphas are 0. And if you take that case, you will find that both of those matrices, if you substitute those values of alpha into the matrix O, both of those cases give the identity. So you can take one choice or you can change the sign of that choice and both of them give you the same result, in this case, the identity matrix. And this is general. Every element of SO3 is mapped onto by two elements of SU2. That's my two for the price of one in the title. Uh, the, mathem the grander mathematical term um, we'll come to in a moment. Each pair in SU2 that maps onto one in SO3 differ just by the sign of the alpha parameters. You say, change all the signs, you get the same transformation. Mathematically, we call this a homomorphism, a many-to-one mapping, and in this case, it's a homomorphism of kernel 2, because two elements of SU2 map onto one of, SU, of SO3. And we should have expected complications here, because if you stop and think about it, we've already said that SO3 has only odd dimension representations. S is 1, P is 3, D is 5, and so on. But if we think about spin, we, it must be the case that SU2 
um, we'll need to have representations of all non-zero dimensions, integer dimensions, because we have singlets, doublets, triplets, quartets. That's uh, singly, doubly, triply, quadruply degenerate. So SU2 has irreps of all irreducible representations of all non-zero integer dimension, whereas SO3 has only odd integer ones. So SU2, if you like, must be more complicated. Let's just remind ourselves what we mean, or what I mean here, by group representations. If we have a couple of group elements G and H that are elements of some group G, and we multiply G and H together to get a new element within the group, the product of G and H, then if we have two matrices, DG and DH, and we multiply them together, we get the matrix that corresponds to this product of group elements. In other words, our irreducible representation matrices multiply the same way as the group elements themselves. They're a representation of the group. Um, without loss of generality, we can take those matrices to be unitary. And by irreducible, then of course we mean that um, to within a transformation, uh, if we, we can reduce the matrix to, or transform the matrix to a block diagonal form, then it's reducible. Um, irreducible simply means if we try and carry that out further, we can't further shrink, reduce the size of the uh, representation matrices. So this is just irreducible representations as you learn them in, in symmetry and group theory uh, as an undergraduate or in kindergarten. So I've already said that SO3 has irreps of odd integer dimension, 1, 3, 5. And you usually write this as 2J plus 1. I wrote 2L plus 1 earlier, but J I'm going to use as a more general index, where J is any non-negative integer. So J equals 0 corresponds to S, one um, dimension. J equals 4 corresponds to um, G, and that's nine-dimensional, and so forth. We can use this same dimensioning scheme, if we want, for the SU2 irreps. But then we have to include J values that are half of an odd integer, like one-half, three-halves, five-halves, and so on, in order to get the even integers from the formula 2J plus 1. And if we then look at the irreps of SU2 and how they map onto the representations of SO3, we find that instead of the multiplication rule I had on the previous slide, we have a somewhat more general multiplication rule where the irrep matrices for G and H produce plus or minus the irreducible representation matrix for the product GH. If J is integer, like SO3, or some representations of SU2, then we get the positive sign, which is what we would naively perhaps have expected. If J is half integer, half an odd integer, then we get the minus sign. And the man, Eugene Wigner himself, in his book, which everybody should have, even though it's a bit old-fashioned and he uses a left-handed axis system, which is not conventional these days. Um, Wigner writes, these half-integer J things are not representations at all. That's a quote from the book. Some people call them double-valued representations because we get end up with two with uh, the sign change. And as I say, to Wigner, these are not representations at all. I think most people these days would regard that as a rather extreme viewpoint. Uh, but their appearance is intimately related to that half angle issue I mentioned when we had the Vigno matrices. We had that little d in the middle and the argument, it was a polynomial with arguments in theta over 2 and it's that theta over 2 that gives rise to this problem with these double valued representations. Now, we can analyze this further 
using the matrices themselves and that Euler angle parameterization, and it's done in Wigner. It's really quite messy. I don't feel it's of enormous pedagogical value. It's a lot easier to do it using group characters. You met group characters when you did representations in your group theory course. The character of a representation is just the trace or the sum of the diagonal elements of the representation matrix. And it's a way to sort of compress the information a bit, not have to carry matrices, but just carry scalars in our character tables and so forth. And if you rotate around some arbitrary axis, doesn't matter, character's the same in all cases, you rotate through an angle phi around some arbitrary axis, we have this formula for the characters. We have sine j plus a half phi over sine of a half phi, half angles again. So let's consider now rotating through a multiple of 2 pi, an integer multiple of 2 pi. So it could be 2 pi, 4 pi, 6 pi, 8 pi, whatever. Well, it's not immediately helpful to apply that because if you insert that into um, the formula for the character, you get um, the value I have here, sine 2j plus 1 of n phi over sine n phi. And if n is integer, both of those signs are zero, so this is indeterminate. Nevertheless, and now we have to retreat to maybe, I won't say kindergarten, but elementary school calculus, and recall de L'Hopital's rule, which tells us that if we have a quotient and the numerator and the denominator are both continuous and differentiable, then the, a limit such as this uh, we can replace with the limit uh, obtained when we differentiate the numerator and separately the denominator. And so if we use de L'Hopital's rule, we get this formula for the limit. And now because we've got cosines, these things have a fighting chance of being non-vanishing and we don't have any unpleasantness um, with uh, indeterminacy. So I've repeated the formula here so you can see it in what I discuss next. Let's take j to be an integer, a non-negative integer. That means 2j plus 1 is odd. And if n in this formula is even, so we have an even multiple of 2 pi, then both the numerator and the denominator are plus 1. If n is odd, so we had an odd multiple of 2 pi, so 2 pi itself, or 6 pi, um, or 10 pi, if n is odd, both the numerator and the denominator are minus 1, which means in either case, the quotient here is 1. And rotating through a multiple of 2 pi gives us the identity. Take j to be a non-negative half integer. Then 2j plus 1 is even. This is what we needed for SU2. And if n is even, then both the numerator and the denominator are plus 1 again. But if n is odd, the numerator is plus 1, but the denominator is minus 1. And that means the character is minus 1. And so here we see our issue. If we have an odd multiple of 2 pi, then for these double-valued representations, 2 pi is not the identity. We need 4 pi to be the identity. And that is summarized in that remark. 2 pi is not the identity for the double-valued representations. For the single-valued representations, the ones we're familiar with from orbital angular momentum, everything is fine. But for the double-valued representations, where we have odd multiples of 2 pi for rotation, we don't obtain the identity. Now, there are two ways to attack this. Well, probably more than two, but there are two ways that are reasonably popular. And for me, it's rather interesting, because I, I'm interested in the sort of, whatever you want to call it, sociology or psychology of, of how science is done in different fields. And by far, I would say these days, the most popular approach to dealing with this issue of the double-valued representations is an approach suggested by physicists. It was actually suggested originally by Hans Bethe. Um, Bethe, of course, is known 
primarily these days for his Nobel Prize winning work in um, uh, stellar astrophysics and the uh, sources of um, uh, radiation and uh, nuclear fusion in stars, in stellar cores. But in the 1920s, Beta made a number of very fundamental contributions to the application of group theory and physics and, if you like, chemistry. And Beta's idea was a relatively simple one. He said, we don't get hung up about this at all. We just forget the idea that 2 pi is the identity. We redefine rotation through 2 pi as if it was a new element in the group. And the, the, in most tables these days, that additional element is just denoted R. If you put another element in a group, you double the order of the group. So if you go, say, from C to V with four elements, order four, the, by adding this new operation, you go to a group of order eight. You have eight elements. And because you've doubled the number of elements in the group, these are very often referred to as double groups. Sometimes, uh, particularly thanks to Hertzberg and his <coughs> excellent books, which you also ought to have, um, is, these are referred to as extended point groups. But I'd say, by and large, the term double group is somewhat more um, common outside spectroscopy. And from a sociological point of view, this is a typical physicist's pragmatism. You know, I, I just want to I, I want to get some work done. I just want a mechanism for getting work done. So that's what I've done here. I've defined a new element for the group, and that makes it all come good because 4 pi is always the identity, and 2 pi can be the identity sometimes and not the identity other times. So everything fits under this umbrella, and I've got something that works. Well, sort of. Um, you find out, particularly in groups of higher order with degenerate representations, that things get a bit more complicated. Sometimes there are ambiguities in phase choices, and you have to make a phase choice. And most of the tables you see, like the ones in Hertzberg, those choices are defined, but they're essentially ad hoc. They're just taken out of the air. I'm going to do it this way. And there's also the question of what does R mean? What does a rotation mean if the original group is, say, CS and you don't have any rotation axes? Um, that's a sort of physical question more than anything else. Um, but it can be made to work. It's just that it has some awkward spots, some deficiencies that we tend to just gloss over and not discuss when we use the double groups. And this is, as I've said, the accepted approach for most chemists and physicists. If you look at a book that discovers, discusses any of these things at all, it is by far most likely that you will see it in terms of double groups. Although that's, there's a standout counterexample to that, and that's another book you should have, and this is available in a Dover reprint, is Morton Hamish, um, Group Theory and Chemical Problems. Um, Here's, it's probably as well to give you an example of what a double group looks like. Here is, in fact, C2V extended with this operator R. You see, now it's started to get more complicated. We have a new representation that's degenerate. If you stop and think about it, we have to have that, because if we have spin, we have doublets, and they're doubly degenerate in the, ad, in the absence of a magnetic field. So we've got to get a double, doubly degenerate representation in here. And it looks like this. And here's R. Um, you will see that uh, in this case, um, the number of uh, representations is equal to the number of classes. Each operation is, is in its own group theoretical class. That's not general for double groups. That, that happens in this case. And again, you start to run into issues because although C2V is an abelian group, all the elements commute. That's not necessarily true when you extend an abelian group to a double group. You may lose uh, commutativity. Now, that's a physicist's approach, finding something that works. Mathematicians are less hidebound about needing to get things done necessarily in practical form. And there's a degree of abstraction sometimes uh, in the mathematician's way of thinking about it, often makes it much more general. And in fact, 
although Beta did his work in 1929, and very valuable it is, I'm not criticizing, in fact, the mathematicians had already tackled this 20 years earlier. And in particular, there's a, there was a German mathematician named Isai Schur. Some of you will have met Schur in the sense that Schur's lemma is a key step in proving the great orthogonality theorem, which is arguably the most important theorem for our purposes in, um, as, as chemists or physicists in group theory. Uh, but Shaw made hugely many contributions to the theory of groups. Um, and one of them was the following. It's one of these, again, I suppose, thoughts you have in the shower, first thing in the morning, perhaps, or when you're out for a walk at the weekend. And Shaw said, why don't I redefine representations? So that instead of if G and H multiply together to make a new element GH, I won't insist that the product of the representation matrices is the representation of this product, but I'll allow it to be multiplied by some complex phase factor unimodular complex phase factor. So it could be plus one, could be minus one, could be e to the i pi over two, or anything that's unimodular. And I can do this for all of the possible products in the group. If the group is of order g, there would be g squared of these things, these objects, these phase factors, and a set of these is termed, in group theory, a factor system for the group. This actually lets us move forward without any fictitious rotation operators. We don't need a new R. We don't need double groups as such. We just have this new definition of representations that they multiply in this way. And sometimes they're called projective representations, which is a rather grander word than the common one which is ray representations. So we've gone from the traditional matrix representations where, well, in the double group, we would have plus or minus one here. In, um, in the regular group, we would have just plus one here. We're allowing this to be any unimodular complex value, and this gives us so-called ray representations. Now, we have to determine the factor system, you may say to me, and you would be right to do so. Um, this is not an entirely trivial business, again relating to things like commutativity. Even if we have G and H commuting in the original group, the factor system may not be symmetric. It may be that um, omega GH is not the same as omega HG, even if the original group were abelian. I look briefly at determining a factor system. We have G squared factors, I already said that, if the group is of order G, that we need to determine. And it's actually not too difficult to find ways to do that, because one of the um, group axioms is that elements multiply associatively. So if we combine G and H, and then combine that with J, we get the same result as if we combine H and J, and then pre-multiply that by G. That's associativity and it's a group property. So let's do that, and let's use the two different forms where we first combine G and H here, or we first combine H and J here. And if we do that, we get this expression, which then we can expand this product, and it will give us this expression for the, uh, the ultimate expansion. If we do it this way, we end up with this expression. And that tells us since we require associativity, that this product must be the same as this product. And there are three indices here, so we have G cubed conditions on G squared quantities. And that's nicely overdetermined. Uh, I'm just restating there what I said. Uh, associativity requires those things to be equal. We have a system that we can solve, and in fact, it's most convenient to solve in terms of complex roots of unity. So the fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, whatever root of unity appears in the factor system. And I think this might be, no, it's not my final book recommendation. 
There is a book called Point Group Theory Tables. Um, came out about 25 years ago by Simon Altman and Peter Herzig. It's basically the last word on the subject. The tables were all generated by computer algebra, and the final form of those tables was then converted into printed material using computer typesetting. So there's no human hand involved. There are no typos or any of those sorts of things. Virtually all representation matrices you can find in the literature for groups of high order have typos in them, which is sometimes very difficult to find. There's none of that in Altman and Herzig. The book was published by Oxford. Bloody expensive. Um, but Knut fergery has got a copy on his bookshelves, I can tell you. Um, and it really is the last word on the subject. And... I think, if, I think it's a pity the book is out of print, but I discovered in correspondence with um, Simon Altman and Peter Herzig that they have reprint permission from Oxford, who aren't going to reprint it themselves, and you can actually download the book in PDF form, and anybody who wants it can send me an email and I'll send you the URI. Everybody should have this fantastic introduction to group theory as well as all these tables. Note, again, there's no extra operators here. We've just got more representations and the addition of a table for the factor system. And while Altman and Herzig list explicitly all the factor, table, factor system tables they use, you don't need the factor system once you've, once you've got it and you've constructed the extended character table with the ray representations. Then you can forget about the factor system. You don't need it uh, as a user at all. So here we have C2V. This is, if you like, the ray representation form. So I haven't put a star on it because we don't have any fictitious R. We have a doubly degenerate representation. Looks a little bit nicer than the one in the double group, in my opinion. Um, and that's the doubly degenerate ray representation. And here, uh, just out of interest, is the factor system. This is the one specified by Altman and Herzig. And you will notice, if you look carefully at the factor system, for example, comparing these two elements, even though the group is abelian, the original group, C2V, the factor table, factor system is not um, symmetric. So we don't have commutativity there. So we've seen that half integer angular momenta, which are associated with spin, creates various complications. We've analyzed this and accepted that in some situations we can't, we find that two, rotation through 2 pi is just not the identity. And we have to accept, we find, need to find ways to deal with that. It can be double groups, as I've alluded to, or again, probably less familiar to you, ray representations. Uh, coming back to a point I made at the beginning, um, spin is an outcome of relativistic quantum mechanics and there's the question then as to whether the whole issue um, in some people's minds has something to do with relativity or quantum mechanics and I've already said not a bit of it. This purely classical thing goes all the way back to Rodrigue in the 1830s. It's a consequence of leaving the axes fixed while we rotate an object as opposed to rotating everything. And it's perhaps curious in something whose origins are purely classical that the person who first found a useful way to illustrate this and indeed prove aspects of it was, in fact, Dirac. Dirac never published what I'm about to show you. Let me see. Yes. He came up with a purely classical model. He didn't publish it, and it's only because people knew that he had done this and he had given talks and so forth that the word filtered down to various of the people involved in quantum mechanics in the 1930s that this was, it's become known as Dirac's construction. It's in a couple of books. Um, it's in Beaton, Hahn and Luke's monumental work on angular momentum. Uh, they credit hearing about it to Eugen Merzbacher. They didn't know about it before. And oddly enough, because it's not really a book about 
anything we think of normally in the big fat book that weighs about 55 kilograms called Gravitation by <laughs> Mr. <laughs> Thorne and Wheeler. <laughs> Mr. Thorne and Wheeler, Gravitation, it's a bloody great huge thing, black book, and it's considered to be essentially the last word on relativistic quantum, uh, relativistic, um, no, I don't mean that, on general relativity. Yeah. And um, it's doubtful that anybody's going to improve very much on, on Mr. Thorne and Wheeler. Um, so... That book also, oddly enough, in an appendix, contains Dirac's construction. And I'm going to try and illustrate that on the green board here, which I realize may or may not work. Uh, uh, it's five past three, so keep that in mind. Yeah, this is the last. Okay. The, the artwork is the, the grand finale. Okay, yeah, yeah, we are all eagerly expecting it. <laughs> <laughs> so... Let me take, as a simple object, a triangle. Let me move this around a bit, perhaps, so that people here can see it a bit better. We've got a triangle. And let me put it in a triangular frame, provided by a second one. And let me, for fun, join these two vertices of the inner triangle to the outer triangle. And let me rotate the inner triangle through pi, around an axis, down through the board here. Yes? All clear? And if we do that, then obviously what happens, and even my artwork I think is good enough to draw this bit, is this string is now connected here, and this string is crossed over and connected here. All clear? Everybody happy with this? All right, let me rotate it another time. So now I've rotated it through 2 pi. Well, then the diagram looks different. And I have this string con connected back to here, but this string is looped through it. Okay? So and now I've got a sort of little knot in here. This goes underneath this one here. Well, if you think about this for a moment, if the strings are, say, rubber bands and are a bit stretchy, I could get hold of this string and I could move it around here and the strings are untangled. I'm back to where I started. Rotation through 2 pi is the identity. Well, Dirac said, that's no fun. And anyway, this isn't a real reference frame, because I haven't tethered the inner triangle to the reference frame. I've only connected it by two strings. So Dirac said, I'll put a third string in here. Well, now you can't pull this string around here, because this string's in the way. So rotation through 2 pi is no longer the identity. Now I've tethered my object to the reference frame. The amazing thing, at least I'm amazed, and I'm not going to try and draw the next bit because it gets too complicated, but it's in Beaton, Hahn, and Luke, and there's a diagram actually of three-dimensional objects in Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler. Dirac was able to show mathematically, it's a little bit of a messy proof, and it involves all those things applied mathematicians like, like infinitely stretchable strings and things like this. But without breaking any strings, Dirac was able to show if you rotate the inner triangle twice more, so you've rotated it through 4 pi, you can untangle the strings. The strings have to be infinitely stretchable, but you don't have to break anything. So in this purely classical construction, got nothing to do with quantum mechanics, relativistics, or anything else, or angular momentum, really, rotation through 4 pi is the identity, and rotation through 2 pi is not. And as I say, I can give you the literature, or I've already given you the literature references, Beaton, Hahn, and Luke, um, or Misner, Thorne, and Wheeler, which is probably easier to come by, and you can see a nice diagram of this. And there are the, the books and so forth. So in conclusion, from the perspective of our sorts of systems, with electrons in them doing things, 
spinning, electron spin, and rotating, that is, momentum, are not the same thing because they obey different um, symmetry principles, different group theoretical principles. We have a homomorphism of SU2 onto SO3, which complicates our lives when we start to consider spin. And I've shown you very superficially a couple of ways in which we can set about dealing with this, that is double groups and ray representations. There's far too much material to um, far too much material on those topics to cover in a single talk. I'll give some lectures on them in um, in Aarhus later this year, all being well. Um, but you can look this up yourselves if you want to follow more of it. So thank you. I'll leave it there. Questions? Thomas first? Yes. It's not really a question. It's, uh, it's, I just want to tell you about what they told me at my kindergarten. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's that one, but it's much, much simpler. It's, you take a plate, you rotate it too high, and you do it like this. Ah, uh, yes, 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 yes. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Nice. Just another uh, uh, example of that. You can use your belt. You take your belt, and you rotate it. Once and twice, and you then turn it over. Ah, oh, no, I messed up, but <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. you get the same result. <laughs> okay, after this amusement. <laughs> and more questions? I am not just. Uh, just another recommendation. I read a little book by Father Cosby. Oh, yes. That was extremely easily digestible, went through all the proofs, etc. Mm -hmm. So, I guess a Russian guy, I'm not sure. So, what was the role of Lee in this? Nothing. Uh, well, a much more. Yeah, a, 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 a much more fundamental um, role, I guess, by first of all defining a class of algebras that you can then use to generate groups. Mm -hmm. Um, with parameterizations that are interesting to us. Of course, um, if you want unitary transformations, then you look at the algebra of um, anti of skew Hermitian matrices, and that the mapping between the algebra and the group is from the algebra of matrix multiplication of um, anti Hermitian or skew Hermitian matrices to unitary transformations. Of course, you do the same thing with skew-symmetric matrices and orthogonal transformations. So if you want to look at this from the perspective of the underlying algebra, and of course, in a sense, second quantization falls into very squarely into that class because you have the general linear group from an algebra of elementary generators that are isomorphic to the um, creation and annihilation operator pairs in second quantization. Um, so that all really goes back to Lee. Okay. So, yeah, we have Lee was a Okay, more questions? Uh, Pete, I had a question from Tromsø. Uh, yes. So, uh, are you going to relate this to something like crystal field theory and so on? Because uh, obviously double groups are very useful for explaining something like why platinum hexafluoride is diamagnetic, for example. Mm -hmm. it's, a D, um, it's a D4 and T2G4 in a you know in regular OH, but it's still yep. diamagnetic. Yes. So the T2G4, uh, yeah. So the answer is yes. I am planning to cover that at least part of it. Uh, although I wouldn't say necessarily that crystal field theory will feature very much in the large. The title, the working title of the book is group theory is molecular symmetry and computational quantum chemistry. And it's heavily focused on the use of group theory in quantum chemical methods. So it's sort of the intersection between group theory and mostly ab initio quantum chemistry, because that's what I know best. Uh, that doesn't mean there won't be references to 
uh, things that are based purely on symmetry arguments, like, for example, crystal field theory. But uh, I, I must say the emphasis will be dominantly on how the group theory can be used in computational methodology. Okay. Thank you. More? Okay, so just let me mention that uh, Peter Taylor came, gave a talk in 79. 79, yes. I remember that. I was a student from 11 Refraction. I, well, I remember you were speaking very fast. And you were uh, uh, surprised that you were so small. <laughs> but, uh, ah. I don't know why I have this issue. Very nice comment. Yeah, I mean, uh, I must listen to your recollections more often. <laughs> I, I, I read the paper, it's something bigger. No, so you were in the morning. Car SCF. Yeah, it was Car SCF. We we really just getting rolling. I don't understand. Uh, we talked about using super, I talked about using super CI methods for the orbital optimization part, oh, okay, yeah. which is what we were moving it's towards in Lund. Anyway, thank you very much. And if uh, you have questions, Peter will be here also on Monday, okay? And, uh, including Monday. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. About and all. No, later than that, I would think. Okay. Uh, it's Thanks an evening flight. All right, uh, pleasure to be here yeah. and to hear about my being small. <laughs> I should remember this. Very good.